Um, so that way, once you satisfy all the CI checks, you make sure everything is green, good to go. Uh, we have our uh, very, um, very nice integration set up, which is basically for doing all of our deployments. Uh, so what we do is we have like a Slack, you can say like a bot program team by respective team. Uh, and we just basically go to a respective uh, you know, Slack channel and uh, run specific you know, commands. And then uh, kind of just make sure we kind of queue all these different PRs. So there's only a couple of PRs which you want to deploy. Uh, we follow like a uh, very interesting queuing mechanism uh, where uh, you dip, you you know kind of group all the PRs and then just wait for them to get deployed. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining the 17th episode of this podcast. I can't really believe it myself. It's been 17 episodes, but we're still going strong, and I have a lot of amazing content for you, especially this episode today. If you're watching on YouTube and you prefer audio-only uh, version of these episodes, it's, uh, I will drop the link for the podcast right here. Um, I publish it on all of the major platforms, so feel free to enjoy it and enjoy these episodes on whichever platform is most suitable for you. And if you're listening from your favorite podcast player and you're not familiar that I have a YouTube channel, I do. And you can go and watch these episodes on YouTube as well by visiting the URL, uh, HTTPS glitch, G-L-I-C-H dot stream. And um, I'm going to drop a link for that in the description as well below. Today, I have a really special guest. Um, I have uh, Sunakshi Zuchi, who is co a colleague of mine. Uh, she is a software engineer currently working at GitHub. She has uh, probably seven years of experience in the industry. She has worked at Microsoft and at eBay prior to joining GitHub. She has always worked as a software engineer. And I think we're going to talk a lot about her experience today and how she ended up at GitHub and the team she's working as part of, which is called the Special Projects Team. Uh, Sunakshi, I'm very happy to have you with me today. And um, can you tell us a little bit more about how did you get into software engineering? Thank you so much. I think so much for uh, inviting me. So pleasure. Um, uh, me getting into software engineering was purely accidental, so to say. Uh, I was. I was. I don't think I was ever meant to be a software engineer. So I thought. Um, I was kind of always intimidated by like I don't know like code and like I thought it was super complex to do and you need to have like really strong brains to do it or whatever. Um, I was a person who loved biology so that's how that's what i thought i would end up doing um it was just a, a very sweet i guess turn of events that happened and um after i finished high school my uh, my father he was like um i don't think biology would be something which i think is suitable for you i've seen your grades really good in uh, areas which would be better if you take up computer science and i was like I mean, I was not so, you know, biased about biology. I just liked it. So I thought, you know, I mean, if he is thinking of that sort, why not? I took a subject and I was like, okay, let me give it a shot. And well, I, after that, I think I never looked back. I, I liked it so much. Uh, I liked programming and I, though I was so scared and I think now I'm not, I feel very comfortable doing it. So I think I kind of owe it up to him that he kind of saw something in me and he felt that I would be good at it um so yeah it's it was... amazing <laughs> it's 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 great when you have parents who can actually guide you you know and just give you advice about what what you think what they think you're you're i mean okay. without really pushing you too hard i mean it's it's exactly. nice just to you know nudge you sometimes in the right direction funny enough uh, i i started in biology as well like i oh I, wow <laughs> yeah i mean i've always had a passion for computers for 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 whatever reason but for yeah. some reason, because maybe my father was a was a doctor, <laughs> I I found oh, myself nice. drifting more towards uh -huh. biology. But then I I felt I felt like this is definitely not not the not the thing for me, and uh, <laughs> I studied yeah. computer science as well. For sure, yeah, I know. Awesome. What um what excites you most about this field? So now that you've got your hands dirty, you know, with writing code and things like that, like how do you feel about your experience today? Um. I think I feel pretty, pretty good in terms of like, um, I think I've been fortunate, um, very fortunate to get very diverse set of experience. Um, just out of school, um, I, I had joined a company where um, 
a pure automobile company, uh, which did a lot of um, in-house enterprise software work. Uh, I got to learn that. That actually was the first time I got introduced to, to doing C sharp. That was not something they would teach you in school uh, back then uh, in India, where I did my schooling. Um, so the first time I learned that entity frameworks, whatnot, so it was a great experience learning that, and then. Uh, you know, getting into doing my higher studies, those that I, I got fascinated with front end. That, that was the time when uh, React and Angular were the only hot topics anybody would talk about and web apps and progressive apps. There were so many, so many meetups that uh, would actually be conducted just to talk about that and kind of introduce that to students and uh, developer community. Um, so it was like, I think, over the period of time from 2013 is when I actually got into a proper corporate setting to like do production stuff, like product uh, ready code, not like school projects. Um, so I feel like over the period of time from 2013 to now, 2022, I've seen so many variations and so many like ideologies changing, like things which were which seemed great at that point of time in terms of technology or doing or building APIs or whatnot for that example has so much changed now. So I think it's it's kind of just amazing how how less code you have to write now. Like there's just so much out there that you can actually utilize and then just make things work. I don't think I've ever written anything from scratch now. Anything I have to do I can always like just just Google and stuff. Something is always there on GitHub or Stack Overflow, so to say, honestly. So uh, it's just amazing, you know, when you do something and you get something working. I think it's just it's just fun, actually. It's so. fascinating how things have evolved since, uh, you know, 2012 and 13. Back yeah. then, like, I, I still remember we, like, jQuery was a thing also. Like, oh, React yeah, was, yeah, like, yeah. very nascent, Angular, you know, people, these were, like, the cool avant-garde pe developers yeah. who got the chance to work on those. But the rest of yeah. us, we were, like, <laughs> struggling with oh, the yeah. jQuery stuff on the front. Oh, end. that, that, was, that that's, a, that's a good point because um, that was one of my final year projects where I was working with a company called Advisory Board. And uh, the tech leads there was like, oh, you know what, Sanakshi, you should really get into jQuery. This is the hot <laughs> thing. If you master this, you you go, like, you get into a lot of good projects and, you know, all of that. And I was like, oh, okay. And now, now like, you know, when you look back, I'm like, oh, God, like, what happened, you know? So it's... <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> It's fascinating how things evolve and how fast we start adopting things, you know, and exactly. just go to production with them. Exactly. It's, it's, it's crazy. All right. So, you know, beyond, beyond how, how fast this field chain changes, mm -hmm. um, what keeps you motivated, you know, to, to keep writing code? Do you, is there something in particular that just, you know, you like about this? I think personally for, for me, um, something which keeps me motivated uh, would be just the sense of, learning something new i'm a person who feels i don't know i've always been a, a student in class who has felt that i know a lot less than everybody else that i have that syndrome always back of my mind um there are times when other people come and acknowledge that hey you did a good job at this or you you really you know did this fairly well than expected and i'm like oh really okay but then i don't know i don't acknowledge that to myself so um I don't know, I think I surprised myself that way. Um, so I feel that, you know, um, um, over a period of time, uh, I think just getting exposed to very different problems or even at GitHub here, like uh, the team I'm part of, so to say, you know, like uh, talking real sense, like special projects, the team I'm with, um, the problems I, you know, face, they're across the board, uh, you know, um, on GitHub, ranging from our enterprise offering to anything on .com to other developer, you know, spaces. So it's like, there's just so much out there, uh, which the unknown for me that I feel when I, when I get to, get, get, when I get exposed to that and I start like digging into it, talking to people, learning about that. I think that's the learning that new thing keeps me kind of motivated. I know that I'm not expert at that, but just the sense of I learned something which I never knew before, it's, I don't know, it just gives me like satisfaction. Oh, it was a productive yeah, right? day. I learned something. So It's so addictive. It's, 
A hundred percent. It's so addictive. Like you keep, you keep it. chasing it. it. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, yes. I feel it all the time. I'm if I, and and at some point, it, it definitely has a darker side. Where if you're not learning something, you feel the anxiety that you need to learn <laughs> something yeah. new, right? But at the same time, we keep on. Yeah. Cha- it's it's fun that this this field keeps sort of reinventing, or we can keep on reinventing ourselves within the field, yeah. right? Like if you're yeah. bored of of, for example, a certain industry vertical, you can just join another one, and it would be a completely different experience. Exactly. Um, if you're building a certain type of code you can just go join another company you'll be building something else entirely and it's yeah. amazing that we even have a um, a team within github that gives also this great opportunity which is the special projects team and what i want to focus yeah. on uh a little bit right now sure. first of all tell me what is this special projects team and what is the purpose of this team um sure yeah it is definitely a very highly purpose and impact driven team, so to say. Um, Special projects uh, is a team which comes under like a pure product strategy vertical um, at GitHub. And uh, the basic idea, uh, I think for the team, or even the origin of the team is to kind of go and fix customer frictions, which maybe uh, are not getting prioritized by respective teams in time because they have their own backlogs, they have their own um, feature sets which are going to be coming up or need to be G8. So there are times when there, there is a lot happening um, and uh, customers kind of, you know, reach out to, you know, via Twitter or whatnot. There are different other ways people uh, provide their feedback and then it needs to be addressed. Some of them are like really good ones, which um, I think if we address them, would make things more productive, would make things more impactful. So I think that kind of goal and mission uh, kind of gave birth to a team like Special Project where we could actually have bandwidth. Um, and it's a, it's a small team. Now it's kind of grown to a bigger team uh, and kind of the scope has increased. But the initial idea was just this, just go fix things, get get our customers or users happy basically i'm a big um, fan of the team to be honest like because I, I my work is on the consulting customer facing side we are at the front lines we get bombarded always with you know friction yeah, issues and whatnot yeah. and i'm so mm-hmm. happy that we finally have a team that is able to just you know pick these issues and just yeah. work on a, on a fix uh, for them i mean i know sometimes that the, the like the final fix has to go to the respective teams because sometimes to. these changes are you know just big yeah. Uh, but can you tell me a little bit more about like the size of the issues that you tackle? Like, is it just pretty much any issue or how do you uh, triage? How do you pick the problems you want to solve? Um, I think we have great uh, product managers on our team um, and they do a good, really, really awesome job at like really sizing what we have to do. The The basic idea is basically to kind of time box the work, like, because we are, we are, we are a team who don't own a product uh, space. It's just, we are just there to kind of support, help, and then hand it off. And that's where our kind of responsibility finishes. Um, I mean, kind, technically it does, but at times it doesn't, goes, goes beyond, but uh, some cases. Uh, but I, we, we do time box it for like three weeks. So anything, if we feel goes beyond three weeks of work, then we kind of make sure it's not that we don't kind of not pick that work, but then it kind of goes more into like, okay, what's the pros and what's the cons of this? Uh, Does it really have a lot of customer value? Does it really, is it impacting like a lot, many, a larger set of customers? Like if it's just kind of helping one or two customers and maybe it's not of a great value and it can kind of wait till the actual team can think about it and then maybe include that in their uh, feature or something uh but if it's not um we we kind of use a lot of data metrics basically uh for that to kind of help us guide if this is something which would really add value so we uh, do reach out to our analytics team a lot uh try to talk to them uh we to maintain good relations with them. So our product and even engineers who pick issues, we try to like get that data, try to like think about that's that's when we try to you know use that data to kind of triage and uh, think how how prior how to kind of prioritize this and then how to kind of 
you know, uh, move forward with these issues. So it can range from big features, which have gone from three to four months to very quick fixes, which is like just a day, fix it, you know, like a UI thing, bugs people, annoying thing, fix it, deploy that and you're done. So um, yeah, pretty much nothing is fixed. It. it can be anything, uh, which makes Amazing. customers that, happy. That's, that's basically the bottom line. <laughs> That's clear. And, and also because I, I know a little bit about the team, when we talk about customers, we're not really just talking about enterprise customers. That's not the point of, of this yes. team, right? Yes. We're talking no. about like every developer on this planet Absolutely. uses GitHub. So. Correct. Uh, the, yeah. All the developer community, um, yeah. not focusing on just our own um, enterprise offering. Yeah. So you mentioned also that you don't necessarily own a product area. Um, you work across multiple teams and multiple yeah. product areas. And of course, these these product areas have their own feature teams, maybe, that, that eventually will have to own this piece of code that your team yeah. might be working on. Yeah. So how does that work? Like, how does this collaboration with these teams work? And what uh, are the friction and pain points of that? For sure, yeah, that's that's a very, very good question and very, very apt for, for a team like ours. Um, I think for the most part, uh, I've been on the team for over a year now, and I've really not had so much friction with the uh, teams who actually owns that piece of code uh, so much. I think people are super, super, super cooperative and very helpful, and they're always willing to kind of share knowledge. Even if they know that they cannot work on it and we are taking the responsibility, they would then go ahead, do our you know PR reviews, make sure they let us know if they're missing something because we don't own it. So we can miss things or we might not know the so-called in-depth technicality of something. Uh, so some things have been super helpful. But yes, there, <laughs> there have been instances where things have kind of got a little rough. Um, and that's obviously, you know, to your point that we don't own something, we do something and hand it over. So there's always this risk factor, which the other team has to kind of bear. What if something goes wrong? Like, do we, do they have the kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, support or resources to kind of support that? Uh, or do they understand the changes? Like why were the change, why was the implementation done so-and-so? Like why not the other way? So there are all of these questions, which then uh, we kind of, hand, we try to handle it best during our handoff or write a very detailed description in our issues, which are basically like tickets, you know, which uh, you, you write uh, for describing the problem you're trying to solve. So we try to be very detailed. Most of our team tries to be very, very verbose about what we're doing, but there are people who try to, you know, are, uh, no, this is I not okay. Understand. Then, there are, yeah, obviously. There are different factors yeah. that come into play. Maybe the team is a bit overworked or they exactly. have different priorities. Um, exactly. Yeah, it's so, not always easy. Yeah, yeah. There's no right and wrong. It's just, yeah. As part of your handoff process, I want to double down a little bit on, on that, that front. What do you think makes a great handoff, right? Like, is it a good, very well-written pull request? And if that's the case, what is a what is a well written pull request example, and how much how deep do you go in terms of documentation? Do you provide any assets, architecture design references, or in terms of like kind of process? I think um, we don't have like a very structured handoff. It's not that we really go deep in like oh you need to have like a you know this kind of documentation or that it's it's not actually that way most of the time uh, but the only thing which we've been doing uh, religiously is just trying to so for anything issues are our source of truth that's what we've maintained um so anything anything you do any sort of technical decisions or conversations you've had outside the scope of the issue you know there are a lot of times where we just dm somebody on the slack channel talk to them let them know if this work is done or it's going to get completed, but that context is not actually, you know, um, kind of persisted somewhere for everybody else to know. So that's not a good practice. So we try to like not do any of those async stuff and try to make sure that we kind of write all our conversations, even our conversations or even whatever has been communicated are, is the other team satisfied with their handoff? Like, were they clear? We, we try to do like these, um, demo videos so we try to do like demo stuff like hey this is the before version of this this is how this thing looked before and this is the after so we try to do as detailed things as possible and like kind of write 
use heavily our markdown skills to make sure um, that it's like properly documented in that way in the issue. But that's pretty much what we do. Um, I don't think there's been very heavy handoff in terms of like doing a lot of aid, like something like an ADR or something. Um, not so much. I think issues have for now been pretty okay and people have kind of given us thumbs up for that. And um, yeah, that, that worked pretty well. All right, that's great. Yeah, and this is what strike me, strikes me a little bit about the GitHub culture. I mean, we do maintain documentation and it's very dependent on the team and it varies yeah. from one product area to another, uh, but we're not really like extensive in how we document things. It's not like we have documentation for every single nook and cranny and how, and how we do things across the board. Um, do you believe this is healthy or do you believe we need to have a little bit more documentation, especially for your team where you need to you know, dig into areas where sometimes yeah, you're not really yeah. familiar with? What do you think about that? That's that's true. Um, We as a team, definitely, we rely a lot on uh, knowledge from other teams to to work on, uh, especially when these are like proper issues, uh, which are, you know, trying to detail like building feature or something of that sort. Um, I think... I think for the most parts, we do have good documentation. It's it's not that we don't have documentation. It's just that it's not structured that well, or it's it, it's not so-called searchable in, in a nice way. So there are times when it's there, but then you don't even know where to look for it or how to search for it. Uh, it's either in a repository, you know, like wiki section or in a readme or on our internal, uh, you know, uh, hub uh, where we try to, you know, have all our engineering documentation or it's somewhere else or it's somebody's personal load or it's in, you know, where you try to like attach something on like Slack and you give some notes there. And so there's like diverse <laughs> information and procedures and steps everywhere. So I think we do have it. It's just that either you have to get very good in searching or I think there'll be initiatives and they I think now things are getting a lot better as we are doing more cross team work. This is something we always bring forward to them. And uh, most of the teams, you know, especially our enterprise teams where we felt, you know, so the documentation did lack and it was very difficult for us to kind of, you know, uh, cope up with that. Um, they've really improvised uh, on their documentation, trying to make it as detailed and as step oriented as possible for anybody who has never even done it, very easy to follow. So uh, there's there are gradual improvements happening in smaller sections as we pick on things, but definitely it's, it's a wider work <laughs> and what's your what's your opinion on documentation like um do you think it should be structured or do you think every team should have the option and freedom to basically put in the documentation whichever way they see fit uh in my personal opinion i'm a big fan of documentation i rely on it heavily so i would say structured is the best way to go forward um but with you know our github culture where there are like people who have different ideas come from very diverse backgrounds or work across the zones maybe they don't concur with the same ideology maybe they want it to be done differently so i don't know but i would i would be super happy if, if this, everything is just documented at, at one place and you can just kind of you know go and just Find search everything. and do yeah. stuff up. Hundred percent. I share the same sentiment because also my work <laughs> involves a lot of uh, searching and digging into code bases, which I have exactly. literally no clue whatsoever how it works or how it's set up. And if it's even if it if even if it works, that's let's start from there. All right, that's great. Um, before I jump into talking a little bit about a really interesting topic, which is how we actually do CI/CD at GitHub, um, I want to talk a little bit more about um, the GitHub culture. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I personally, I'm. I fell in love with it when I when I first joined because of so many different reasons. But I want to hear from you. What do you think mm -hmm. makes GitHub, whatever GitHub is, right? Like <laughs> how people are. What makes it distinct and and different from any other place you've worked at? Right. Yeah. For sure. Um, a very short and a crisp answer would be GitHub is definitely very different than other companies I've worked for. Uh, I've never, never worked 100% remote, so to say. So this is definitely a very a fresh and a new lifestyle I have at work <laughs> or a relationship I have at work. Um, honestly, I was not a big fan of this initially. Uh, I think it was during the pandemic in 2020 when I was 
kind of forced not to commute and stay at home and work. Um, it was boring. Uh, and I was not a big fan of being on the computer so long. Like, it, because we do pair with engineers, right? We want to work something or we want to discuss something. So it was like this constant Zoom and scheduling and trying to see what time fits their time zone and all of that. So I thought this was ugh, pure nonsense. Like, why can't I just like, you know, like turn my chair and be like, hey, I have a question. And, you know, just talk through and do a whiteboard and get get done with it, you know, or, or go and grab lunch and coffee. So I was kind of really missing that association. So I was like, oh, this sucks. This is not for me. Um, but I think six months down the line, I felt I kind of fell in love with it. I was like, oh, this is great. Um, I can be home. I can cook whenever I want. Um, I, I have a small baby. I can take care of her. So. I think it just grew on me now. So I feel um, the whole asynchronous and, um, you know, remoteness of GitHub gives you a lot of power as well as an engineer. Uh, I mean, you're definitely accountable for your work. You sh you make sure you're, you're doing things, you know, in your own time frame. It gives you that flexibility, but also that, um, you know, uh, responsibility of making sure that you do things gives you a good work-life balance which i think works out pretty well now <laughs> yeah this feels like an episode where we are uh, literally like promoting github but we are I, we are in a way right i mean it's a great place mind. to work yeah, it, it, it is uh, it is so i don't mind if it's taken that way um there are definitely good things about github so 100%. i mean why not highlight them right? <laughs> 100%, 100%. I was going to ask you about remote work, but you already answered that part. So, so that's great because like, yeah. I mean, th th there's ev many nice things about working remote. And, and I think one of the things that GitHub does really well is having a culture that embraces remote work, especially because like 70% of the workforce at GitHub used to work remote before even the pandemic. So right. when the pandemic hit, a lot of teams didn't really notice much change, change. Yeah. yeah it yeah. was pretty normal for us yeah. to adapt and adjust to that and let's move on to talk a little bit about continuous integration continuous deployment and delivery how do we do uh ci cd at github can you can you talk a little bit more about that sure uh um i think the the whole um ci cd process at github is um, pretty mature pretty streamlined uh, for the most parts um there are improvements and enhancements which which are definitely which keep going but it works very well um the process most of the time starts with obviously uh opening up a pull request um so when you work on an issue you make sure you create a pull request with whatever code changes you feel relevant um and you know you Either there are, there are times where uh, you follow like a proper template in your pull request, detail them out, what whatnot, um, and then we have our um, CI jobs, uh, which basically kind of a run through, uh, which are basically you can say like gateways. So they are just basically uh, nothing but just you know background jobs, programs, code written to kind of gate and check the quality of the code. Uh, you know. Things which I've checked out, like say for example, linting. You know, you have to make sure that you know you're following the proper uh, linting uh, guidelines. And if not, our uh, CI does kind of you know uh, throw all the bunch of errors, which you can very easily click and kind of verify which file, which line had the problem, and gives you detailed uh, uh, commands or scripts to kind of run uh, and then correct them in your uh, local. Uh, uh, development environment or in case you're using code spaces whatever you prefer um so that way once you satisfy all the ci checks you make sure everything is green good to go uh we have our uh, very um very nice integration setup which is basically for doing all of our deployments uh so what we do is we have like a slack you can say like a bot program team by respective team uh and we just basically go to a respective uh, you know slack channel and uh, run specific you know commands and then uh kind of just make sure we kind of queue all these different prs because we a couple of prs which you want to deploy uh we follow like a, a very interesting queue mechanism uh where uh you do you you know, kind of group all the PRs and then just wait for them to get deployed. Uh, obviously, the deployment process doesn't stop there. Uh, you can go do other stuff in parallel, but then um, 
the the bot basically looks into these PRs and then creates again its own in the background. It is it's basically doing work work for you. Uh, so it's kind of that process piece that last piece has been automated where it does the deployment to different uh, staging and other environments. So it goes through like a, you can actually go to um, um, one of the, we have an internal uh, page or view where you can kind of see the status of uh, how the deployment is kind of going. Uh, and meanwhile, you can even look at other portals like Sentry or Splunk to make sure that anytime the things are getting deployed, say first to staging, things are fine, or to a canary, uh, things are not, you know, spiking or whatnot. Uh, and then finally, you know, uh, all of these different environments are gated. So every time the deployment happens, we do have like a buffer of five to 10 minutes to make sure that we have not broken anything or somebody else's PR didn't break anything. So um, that's always kind of gated that way, which is, which is pretty good. So you can, before anything makes it to the third and the final uh, stage uh, deployment, where it is deployment to production, you can always stop something. So we also have, uh, you know, like doc commands for that, which you can run in Slack and be like, okay, hey, I want to kind of uh, unqueue this or entrain this or like stop this deployment. Uh, so which gives you a good uh, flexibility as well to kind of not just go through, like, it's not just automation, but you can manually dive in and fix something and get something so that production is never in a bad state. So, um, um, the one piece which I would probably add is uh, our deployment is interesting at this point. We have, the way it kind of works is there is always somebody who kind of conducts this whole process. So there's always somebody who's kind of having a manual eye on how the things are going. And if there's something wrong, they would reach out to specific people. They're like, hey, you know what? All of your PRs uh, were cute. And, you know, I think that's how things are going around. So you might want to check that. So it's always like a, a person who, checks this and makes sure uh, things are going fine. But um, I think now the process is changing. We are coming up with a lot of other uh, features or in, you know the things are evolving in deployment process as well, where you don't want one person to be responsible for looking into the you know failures or spikes during when it makes it to different stages, but then uh, you, know, you yourself are kind of accountable for uh, your own feature, which is getting deployed, which is, I think, pretty good. Um, so, but that's that's kind of a generic idea of how it, uh, how things are. Um, yeah. Oh, it's a perfect summary. I mean, I I definitely could not have summarized it myself in like two minutes <laughs> the way you did. That's great. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you. So, a couple of questions I have. Like, do you have do we have any um, human gates in the sense that are there manager approvals required at any step of the way in the deployment process? Oh yeah, I, yeah. I, that's a that's a good point. I missed that. Uh, definitely, anything at GitHub, uh, any times of anything, any PR which makes it to even staging like environment has to go uh, via the, the CI checks I mentioned, as well as approvals. So without an approval, uh, without the CI uh, jobs being passed and green and happy, uh, nothing can make it to uh, any of the even testing. Uh, if you want to say environments, let alone production. So yes, um, whoever is probably, I think the respective team uh, or feature owner has to kind of sign off uh, on that. So once they sign and sign off and they feel that you've covered all the use cases, you're, you have written test cases for that unit test or integration test, everything looks good, then um, then you can kind of, you know, queue up your PR in. But just to clarify, the approvals just are on the level of the pull request itself. So they just approve the pull request. And after that, everything else is just automated until the point where, you know, it's it's part of the train and then the conductor manages the, the release. Uh, Correct. That's right. That's yes. That's okay. how it is. Great. Yeah. I just wanted to create a distinction between this and where, for example, everything stops until a manager actually says, okay, for a certain release to go into production. Uh, and this is beyond mm -hmm. the pull request point, which this is Correct. a something i've seen a lot in the field i'm not mm. a big fan of mm. <laughs> I, I like I'm our way of doing I, things i've not seen that at github though yeah I'm not definitely not at github, GitHub. Yeah. i've seen it at, yeah. in the field like with different uh organizations or customers got it, um, got it. and okay. i think it, it sort of defeats a little bit the purpose of you know having these pipelines in a way where you just have to wait for the quality assurance team approval and then the manager's approval and then you have to bundle yeah. everything into a release and then maybe you release once every month instead of multiple times oh, a wow. day. Oh, wow. Once yeah. a month. It happens, happens a lot. A lot. <laughs> it happens a lot. 
you'd be surprised. But I've seen a lot of organizations start with that, which is okay if you're starting okay. out. Yeah. But then you definitely have to improve your 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 mechanisms of of deployment. Because sure. if we can you imagine if we had GitHub release once a month, that would be like uh yeah. Oh my so god. <laughs> I think we would need multiple special projects team then. <laughs> 100%. Just th resolving the merge the, the conflicts and all of that stuff would be just a yes. nightmare. Oh, it would be. <laughs> all right. Amazing. Um and this has been fantastic so far. Like I, I, I would really love to talk to you for hours uh, about this. Um, but the last couple of things I want to ask about is how do you personally grow as a software engineer? Like you've been in the field for a while. Uh, you've worked with great companies. You've been part of great, highly impactful teams. Um, how do you stay sharp technically or non-technically also? And uh, what are you currently focusing on right now in your personal development? I focus mostly on two things. Uh, one is um, having some sort of um, mentorship. And two is all it's just reading stuff, reading pull requests. I love reading pull requests, call of people. I think that's a great way, like learning things. There are times when you won't even understand anything. Like that happens to me. I, don't, I know that GitHub has a lot of smart, smart people. But then for me, it's like, uh, a lot of areas I don't know, which are like, I don't know, infrastructure platform. I don't know like what the YAML talks about. Um, but it's just nice to kind of see some demos, some screenshots, and kind of just understand like, oh, you know, if I have to do something similar, I at least know whom I can talk to because I know this person worked on that. Um, that's something which I religiously kind of follow. Uh, and I keep a note of that to just keep myself you can't know everything what's happening at GitHub because you know how many pull requests get created and deployed every minute. So that's that's no job of a single person. Uh, but as much as possible, uh, like anything interesting comes to mind, team posts, as you know, uh, you know uh, at GitHub, which is a very great way of learning uh, what's happening across team. Uh, team posts are nothing but like small. Um, blog posts which we kind of write up do like a write-up of our feature we try to write why we did this what was the impact you know how does you know uh, how many customers we helped and all things like that uh, and most of the time all the teams kind of uh, write that and share across uh, into our engineering channel um, uh, which everybody kind of gets notified for uh, in github uh, but it's also a great way of like learning um, new technology or understanding uh, what new designs or what new things are coming up at github and then just reading about that and maybe talking to other peers who we think know better uh, the first point i mentioned about mentorship that's something i also feel is has been very helpful for me individually uh, and i think for many people i think they would agree that it's very helpful to have somebody who is um you know at a senior level uh, within the company or even outside whom you kind of look up to and you feel that you know they have the right i mean it's not i don't i don't talk to mentors for like technical advice it's more just general conversation you know there are times when i joined the industry i never knew uh how to do how to talk in one-on-one -on -one or how to schedule a skip level i don't know what i should talk to them what kind of questions should i be asking them or should it just be like i don't know like how you're doing and then i don't even know what the next question should be so uh just kind of understanding or getting the maturity to to talk through and um kind of understand their perspective, try to collect feedback from them and maybe use that in some way. Uh, so I think these two things have kind of worked hand in hand for me uh, as I've kind of, you know, moved jobs or moved from one tech stack to the other. Um, I think that's, that's been super valuable for me to kind of just grow overall as an engineer, just not specifically in a technology, but just getting a more wholesome idea of, you know, everything, you know, generalistic way. Yeah, I'm so happy to be to hear you say these things because I just uh, released a small video today talking about how senior engineers can grow. And I was just literally oh, yeah. highlighting how, uh, you know, senior for, the, for senior engineers, for them to get to the next level, communication skills, the soft skills are so fundamental. Like mm -hmm. nobody's going to look at your technical skills beyond a certain point in time, you know, of your career. Of course, yeah. your achievements are always going to be highlighted. But yeah. beyond that point, it's about how much impact you're going to have on everyone around you that mm -hmm. is not necessarily related to your technical capacity. That's um, true. 
Awesome. So actually, this has been fantastic. Do you have any advice for some of our aspiring listeners, for example, who, who maybe are thinking or uh, wanting to join GitHub at some point in the future, or maybe companies <laughs> like GitHub? Do you have any advice for them? Um, oh, I don't think I've ever given advice to anybody. <laughs> or if I give advice, nobody listens, but I'll try. <laughs> um, I think... Um, the only I can say from my own personal experience or, you know, uh, the background I come from or where I'm today, I would just say that um, just go with your gut feeling uh, about something. And if you feel that you want to learn something, just, just just go for it. Like I never thought I would be doing something or pursuing something in computer science and, and having like a software engineer or being a software engineer professionally. But then here I am doing that day in, day out. Um, so, um yeah, like if you like something, you're passionate about that, I think give it a try. If it doesn't work out, then try something else. But yeah, end of the day, I think things work out. So, you know, uh, I think it's important to have that perseverance and be positive. So yeah, that's, that's all I would say. <laughs> Amazing. You're very humble uh, for all of the great work that you do. Thank you very much, Sonakshi, for your time. This has been really Thank a pleasure. Thank you so much. It was, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so Fantastic. much for having me. And thank you everyone for listening and we'll catch you on the next episode.